Hello, good morning. Thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar on uh, working with living labs in projects. This living lab is uh, part of the call information sessions of the call for proposals 2022-2024. So uh, first of all, please let me uh, introduce you the agenda of um, this morning uh, webinar. Uh, first, I will start introducing a little bit um, the Living Labs uh, topic and um, the objectives and scope of this webinar. Then I will uh, give the floor to uh, Maria Alonso Raposo from the Joint Research Center, who will uh, help us to set the scene on the uh, increasing importance of Living Labs in the innovation landscape of urban mobility in Europe. And then uh, both Juho Kosteinen and Jose Maria Salanova from uh, City of Helsinki and SERF will share with uh, us uh, their experience on uh, working with living labs in the, in the city of Helsinki and in, in Greece. Then um, I will give you also some uh, tips and advice on how to address the living labs uh, topic in um, your project proposals for the uh, upcoming call for, call for uh, innovation projects. And uh, last but not least, uh, as you can see, there is also some time um, for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so please feel free to post your uh, questions, comments, uh, concerns um, during, the, during the webinar on the chat of uh, B2Match. And uh, we will try to address all of them uh, in this last part of, of the webinar. So um, please, uh, first of all, let me introduce um, the speakers that are with us today. Um, our first speaker, uh, Maria Alonso Raposo, uh, holds a degree in industrial design engineering and human computer interaction. She worked as a researcher on human factors in driving in the private sector for about 15 years. Then she joined the Sustainable Transport Unit at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission as a technology and policy analyst on autonomous road transport. The main focus of her work is the analysis of the social and economic implications of uh, cooperative, connected and automated mobility in support of uh, the EU policy making in this area. In the present, she is responsible for the scientific activities of the Future Mobility Solutions Living Lab, engaging citizens in the co-creation of future mobility. Our second speaker will be uh, Juho Kostienen, uh, that uh, works for the city of Helsinki as a project manager. He is the coordinator for the Jat Kasari uh, Mobility Lab, the Helsinki Testbed for Smart Mobility. For the past 10 years, he's been working with research, development, and innovation activities in the field of smart mobility. And our third speaker will be Jose Maria Salanova, a senior researcher of the Hellenic Institute of Transport of the Center for Research and Technology, HELAS, where he's leading the data analysis and modeling laboratory. His scientific interests concern research and developments in transport and mostly in algorithm and model development, mobility, intermodal, intermodal transport and logistics, as well as data science and big data at the transport domain. And I am Jordi Casas, City Club uh, and Living Labs Officer, and I will be uh, moderating this, this webinar, please. So, well, let me give you some background on, on the Living Labs and the EIT Urban Mobility. Uh, we do consider Living Labs as key enablers of innovation in the field of urban mobility. And that's why we, we would like to promote uh, this approach uh, in our uh, GIC community. On the one hand, we consider Living Labs as uh, potential innovation catalysts that could help cities to, to identify the best solutions uh, to address and tackle their uh, needs and challenges. And on the other hand, um, 
we also consider living labs as uh, uh, something that can facilitate businesses access to the cities to ensure the most efficient market uptake. As I said before, this webinar is, uh, is part of uh, the open information sessions of the call for proposals of uh, next year. And um, well, city demonstrators and living labs will be an in integral part of the projects co-funded under the first call for, call for proposals for business plan 2022-2024 across the innovation and business creation program areas. Please. So um, there are three objectives of, of this webinar. The first one is to provide an overview of the Living Labs approach and raise awareness. The second one is to share knowledge from, from those who are directly working with Living Labs in Europe, such as uh, the three speakers that um, we, we have this morning with us, and also to provide useful tips and advice on how to address the Living Labs topic in your project proposals. Next, please. Just to, to give you some, um, some definitions and some information on, on Living Labs, according to the European Network of Living Labs, Living Labs are user-centered open innovation ecosystems based on a systematic user co-creation approach, integrating research and innovation processes in real life communities and settings. And that means that uh, to truly qualify as a living lab, uh, five key elements should be present. The first one is an, an active involvement of the end, end users of the, the new product or service that is being um, developed. Uh, the second one is um, to carry on tests, experiments, pilots in real life environments, not in laboratories, not in controlled environments. The third key element is the um, participation of uh, representatives of the quadruple helix um, in, the, in the overall process. So representatives of uh, academia, of the private sector, industry, startups, um, SMEs, from the, also from the public sector, and, the, uh, the, and also the citizens or any other kind of end users. Um, also, the, the use of co-creation techniques uh, with, uh, with these uh, end users, and the application of um, multi-method approach. However, despite this clear definition, uh, while um, speaking with key, real, key relevant stakeholders across Europe, we realize that in practice, a common mobility living labs uh, language is still missing. Living labs are being referred as a method, a context, an ecosystem uh, with some kind of participatory nature. So there is not yet a clear established boundary between living labs and other uh, innovation approaches such as test beds, pilots, demonstrations, and so on. But what is, uh, what is really clear to us is that uh, living labs distinguish with uh, all these other uh, innovation approaches by the extent of the end user involvement and the kind of activities uh, performed. Living labs uh, can focus on all uh, stages or all phases of the innovation uh, process, uh, can be focused on user ideation, on co-creation, on validation activities, or in all of uh, the, on the whole innovation process. And also uh, they, they, they distinguish because uh, multiple uh, stakeholders are somehow involved in the in the activities next please so that's uh that's all from my side um now i will uh, pass the floor to maria alonso raposo from the grc who will um, help us to set the scene on the importance of living labs in in europe please Maria, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jordi. 
and good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you today in this webinar and contribute to be setting the scene about living labs in the urban mobility context in particular, share with you the experiences we've gathered so far in implementing a living lab at the heart of the European Commission's Joint Research Center. So we can start by, um, by highlighting the importance of mobility in our economy and in our society but also reflecting and recognizing that it poses an acceptable burden to it. Uh, so this is in the form of road accidents, of climate change, pollution, uh, also congestion. And we can certainly reflect on how our mobility center around the cars. So actually 50% of public space is devoted to roads at the moment. So with the increased urbanization uh, trend in which um, it is expected that by 2050, 84% of the EU population will be living in cities. Uh, we need to recognize that all these challenges, all these negative externalities are certainly intensified in urban areas. Uh, next slide, please. So normally the way in which these negative externalities are being addressed is through new uh, technological innovations or other types of innovation, also innovation in policies. Uh, but often uh, also we need to, to, um, to recognize that these solutions are uh, not, not always accounting for the real citizens' needs or for their expectations. So this actually results in a, a low technology adoption and therefore lower benefits uh, compared to the ones that we, we can expect. At the same time, the, the impact of this new technologies and new uh, approaches can, can have uh, are broad and are far reaching and complex. And it is uh, hard to fully understand these dynamics and these impacts without experimenting the solutions in, in a real life setting. So um, in the next slide, we, we actually pose what is for us the, the, core, the core question. What if we could engage uh, citizens in the co-creation of this future mobility? What if we could make them play an active role in, in co-designing these new uh, solutions in real life living love environments? What if we could help cities find better ways to, to address their needs, their challenges and goals? And what if we could help industry as well in developing tailored uh, products and services that are addressed so needs and, and can have a higher market uptake? So we, we need to recognize that the only way to succeed in, in the European Green Deal is um, by involving these different stakeholders and the public. And actually the European Green Deal makes uh, a very relevant reference in that uh, game-changing policies will only succeed, will only work if uh, citizens are fully involved in designing these policies. So uh, this is certainly what, what we have put at, at the core of our activities. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is why we implemented a mobility living lab at the Joint Research Center located in, in Ispra in the north of Italy, with the aim of engaging both citizens and the different relevant players in the mobility landscape in co-creating the future mobility. So uh, the, the living lab, uh, our living lab has um, multifold objectives. So one main objective is actually to provide a citizen-centered policy tool. Uh, so acting as a regulatory sandbox in, in which uh, it is possible to experiment in real life new technologies, new methodologies, new policies, and use these insights to directly feed into the policymaking cycle. So um, being uh, given that the, the mission of the JRC is actually to, um, to, to underpin EU policies with independent scientific advice, this is um, one of the main objectives of our living lab. At the same time, we'd like to provide support to startups and SMEs in co-designing and then developing and testing their innovative solutions so that they can have a higher market uptake. And we want to, uh, to, to achieve also our own transformation at the level of our sites and go towards a modernization that leads to smart, open, efficient, and sustainable environments. So uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to refer again to the, to the definition that Jordi introduced at the beginning, so provided by the European Network of Living Labs as one of the most commonly used ones, and the five different key elements. So um, I think Jordi explained uh, really well what are the key uh, features and we could indeed highlight 
the use of the real life environment with all its uncontrollable dynamics and all the, the um, uh, natural interactions that take place in, in the user's daily environment. And we can also refer to the co-creation, uh, uh, the application of co-creation approaches with users uh, rather than for users and actively engaging users since the beginning of the innovation development process. So um, certainly this, this features together with the involvement of multiple stakeholders uh, as, uh, as explained before, are certainly at the core of, uh, of Living Labs and how we um, interpret Living Labs to be. And it's important, uh, as Georgie anticipated, to, to distinguish Living Labs from test beds, pilots, demonstrations, uh, which are, have certainly a, a distant um, nature. So uh, in the next slides, I, I'd like to provide you with a bit what our experiences have been so far in, in each of these different key characteristics, key components, so in, in setting up uh, a living lab at the JRC. So the real life environment that we have provided uh, is uh, located in the ISPRA site of the JRC. Uh, which is the largest uh, site uh, among the uh, different locations where, where the JSC exists in the European Union. And it is hosting more than 2,000 uh, people, including staff, uh, plus also visitors, and uh, well, including service providers as well, and people that have real uh, daily needs. Uh, for example, with regard to mobility, the mobility on site, given it big size and, and the needs of, of people, um, makes it um, a real need to. to be moving within the site and uh, and making use of its internal network of 36 kilometers of roads therefore having interaction between different traffic participants cars uh, bicycles pedestrians and having a real um, say traffic uh, transport network uh, and there is also an important feature which is that the italian law is applied under the sole responsibility of the jersey it is a fully fenced site so the Jersey itself is acting as um, a kind of local authority in implementing the law. So it's um, all in all, it's uh, providing a small city-like environment and where it's possible to, to use the, the different technological innovations uh, that are part of the living lab uh, in the day-to-day -day normal operation and functioning of the site. So um, in the next slide, I'm actually providing a few lessons learned from this real life environment. So the real life environment certainly gives access to some uh, specific groups of users or some population, which is the one that, that lives in, in this environment. And, um, and we need to recognize that this has limitations. So uh, it's actually not possible to extrapolate the results that you find um, in the context of, of a certain area to the general population. So recognizing these differences, but at the same time, recognizing that we need to move towards inclusivity. So we need to, to involve as well other types uh, of users, other segments of the population. Um, and at the same time, we need to upscale the innovation. So we need to, to uh, understand if the results can be replicated in other areas. And, uh, and for this, for these different uh, um, items, we are pressuring collaborations with other living labs that can certainly uh, help in finding synergies and the possibility for, for moving towards these objectives. In the next slide, um, I'm showing uh, how we are um, achieving multi-stakeholder collaborative projects. So in 2019, we published a call for expressions of interest so that external entities can apply uh, to co-create their smart city solutions using our living labs. And for this, we're offering both our mobility living lab in ISPRA and the energy uh, living lab, which is existing in ISPRA uh, and also in Patton in the Netherlands. And uh, different types of solutions are, are targeted and there, there are certain selection criteria for the uh, applications that we receive that are then assessed by, a, by an expert panel. And, um, among these criteria, I think we could highlight the relevance to the EU policy context. So, uh, so as, as mentioned, we are the science and knowledge service of the Commission. Our mission is to support EU policies uh, with evidence so that the, the applications need to be aligned with what are the current policy priorities for the European Union. 
And another relevant criterion is the uh, feasibility in terms of cost and competencies. So for this, um, what we aim for is to find a mutual benefit so that both parties can find value in the collaboration. And this means uh, that this value is not necessarily, is not based on, on monetary exchange. So um, in this regard, we are not offering any funding through this call and we are not asking for any fee to these external entities to have access to our facilities. So uh, let's say our approach is based on uh, um, the fact that startups can find value in accessing the city-like environment, the significant pool of users, accessing our world-class uh, facilities and uh, including laboratories, having getting support from the scientific and technical staff as well. And on the other hand, the GRC is benefiting from having access to the innovations and, and seeing them developed, uh, deployed in, in practice and experimented uh, by users so that we can understand whether uh, users um, accept and adopt these technologies, how their behavior changes, and we can understand what type of impact these technologies provide. And with this evidence, we can provide better support to, to policy making in the mobility field. So far, um, we have um, uh, three successful applications uh, of the Mobility Living Lab. So there's one project on ride sharing, another one on an electric automated platform, another one is uh, related to an automated delivery and trike. Um, and they are in different stages at, at the moment, different stages of developing. So the call is currently open. So uh, in case there, there is interest among the audience and um, also let me emphasize that the call is then complemented by other types of projects that the GRC runs as part of its normal activity, its work program, uh, whether these projects are scientific ones, whether they are coming from requests that we directly receive from our policy uh, partners, um, in the Directory Generals in Brussels, and other projects are directly uh, driven by the infrastructure as initiators of a project and, uh, and going hand in hand with the living lab as well, uh, given the key role of, of the infrastructures as part of a living lab. So um, in the next uh, slide in the box, I'm showing a few lessons learned in, with regard to this multi-stakeholder collaboration. So we recognize the need to find commitment at all levels, so both at operational and strategic levels, we need to have um, to, to achieve this commitment and we recognize that this requires um, a cultural change within the organization so it's something that is not achieved overnight so, but, but requires um, a bit of time so it's more towards the medium to long term. At the same time we recognize the need to find effective ways to engage other types of stakeholders that go beyond the parties that actually um, decide to, to join forces in this kind of collab collaboration agreement. So, for example, other living labs or public authorities or um, yeah, policymakers. So, actually, making all together be part of of these um, collaborative uh, projects. In the next uh, slides, um, I'm presenting three examples that go uh, towards these other three key components of living labs. And these are examples of activities of running these different projects, these different living lab projects we, we have at the moment. And they are reflected uh, in the different steps uh, of the living lab integrative process from Mastelic, these different six steps. So at the very beginning, we started by launching a survey on mobility habits and needs. Um, we needed to understand what are, what, what are the mobility needs of people, what, what problems they're facing, what are their preferences, and we aim at doing so, understanding the pre-COVID uh, situation and their expectations toward the post-pandemic, um, addressing commuting uh, habits, addressing their mobility within the limits of the site and also their business trips. And we also assess their willingness to use some of the applications that, uh, that are planned to be, to be deployed in the context of the living lab. So in particular, the autonomous shuttle and the automated delivery droid. And we, we could understand that a, lar a large majority, a majority of users uh, of the respondents of, of the survey would like to make use of these different services on site. In the next slide, um, I'm showing the second activity we conducted, which are a set of focus group discussions with more than 70 people in an international context. So relying 
on the collaboration with two other entities, um, research, research entities in Spain and Germany, uh, with the aim of exploring deeper the expectations and concerns of citizens uh, about connected and automated vehicles. So um, this activity is a bit placed a bit between the problem definition and looking at the solution already, because we want to understand a bit what what kind of mobility practices and what kind of systems they are using at the moment, but at the same time looking at some new solutions like aut autonomous vehicles or, or connected vehicles. So we could uh, we could gain very valuable insights from from this type of discussions. And in the next slide, uh, we're showing also a third activity which is again plays a bit in the middle between this problem and solution space of, of the Mastelic methodology uh, and consisting of a set of interviews, qualitative interviews that we uh, run with some JSC colleagues. So in this case, it was more focused uh, on, the, on the ISPRA context. And um, our interest was, again, understanding a bit of mobility needs and mobility problems, what, what they like to change in the mobility. Uh, and then uh, trying to understand their attitudes, their opinion towards uh, an innovative social ride sharing uh, service. So in this case, we were already providing some preliminary um, descriptions of the service and, and, uh, and some kind of scenarios and, and they could provide valuable feedback as, as to whether this type of service would fit their, their mobility in the future. So um, in the next uh, box, <laughs> we can see the, the few lessons learned out of these different activities. So we recognize uh, that uh, there are diverse forms uh, in which we can engage uh, users and they can work uh, in, in very efficient ways as, as we have learned. At the same time, these different options have some limitations. So in the current uh, context and, and since last year, we've been running these focus group discussions, interviews and surveys, of course, in, in, in a virtual setting. So this has provided us with some benefits, for example, accessing people uh, in, in easier ways uh, because we don't need to find this, this physical uh, context in which uh, we need to meet. Uh, on the other hand, there are some limitations of interaction and inclusivity. So uh, this type of tools are not certainly the same as, as um, discussing uh, lively in person. At the same time, the, the, the tools I think are evolving and we are also mastering. So we achieved quite, quite a good compromise. And in terms of inclusivity, there are certain segments of the population that have not been included either because of our choice as part of the sampling criteria or because of the type of, of tool. So the type of engagement approach is certainly uh, having an effect on, on the inclusivity as well. Uh, we have also managed to, to assess and integrate all the ethics and legal issues that are part of, of this type of activities with, uh, with users in, in terms, for example, of the protection of personal data. And a few, uh, a couple of other lessons learned that are looking more at the next steps that we are going to be addressing in the future. So we understand we will need to gather also more uh, knowledge about other mobility stakeholders that have not been part of our discussion so far. Um, for example, making use of interviews and, um, and focusing on policymakers, on other, for example, um, um, academia um, stakeholders. So gaining also information from them on these first steps of, of the methodology would be very relevant. And we would need to engage then citizens in real life experimentation. So these uh, different living lab activities that we are developing with, um, with startups are going to reach an experimental phase over the next month. And this will give us the opportunity of showing citizens uh, the solutions in, in action and they can directly experience in a, in a natural setting, not in a naturalistic setting. So in the next slide, um, I'm showing a bit what we have uh, achieved so far. So in the course of the last uh, 12 months, um, if you can please go ahead uh, with the, the animation. In the last 12 months, we've been able to engage more than 600 users in all these different type of um, uh, engagement approaches. So workshops, uh, interviews, surveys, um, and focus group discussions. And our aim uh, is to engage the whole GRC's population and possibly going 
beyond the East Plateau towards other sides over the course of, uh, of next year. But we recognize that so far the data we've got, it gives a good picture of what are the matters of concerns and the, the desires of uh, citizens towards the future uh, mobility. Um, so in the next slide, I'm showing the vision, our vision of the future of our living lab. So we believe uh, the living lab is contributing to, to transitioning from the current car-centered mobility towards the future citizen-centered uh, one. And we recognize that this endeavor is not um, our only, uh, we are not alone in this endeavor, but we, um, we need to rely on finding synergies and collaborating with other uh, relevant players, with other stakeholders, with other living labs. So this is why we are uh, very happy to have joined you today and, and to be pursuing these different collaborations in, in different contexts. So the very last slide is showing you who we are. Um, so in case you'd like to contact us, you'd like to, to explore um, possible synergies and collaborations, we would be very happy um, to, to be in contact with you. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hand over back to Jordi. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for your presentation and for sharing with us some examples of uh, and end user engagement, co-creation, multi-method activities, and also to share with us uh, some lessons learned in, in the process of setting up and, and managing your own living lab in your headquarters in, in ISPRA. Um, now we are moving to uh, the city of Helsinki where uh, Juho Kostiainen um, will uh, share with us uh, their experience in working uh, with living labs. Please, uh, Juho, you can go ahead. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm Juho Kostane from the city of Helsinki. I'm from the unit called Innovations and New Experiments under the Economic Development Department in the city. And uh, my work is focused on the test bed activities, mobility lab, living lab, whatever you want to call it, and piloting new smart mobility solutions in the urban space. And uh, one of the underlying things here is that the Helsinki city strategy uh, points out that we want to develop the whole city as a test platform and an environment that helps develop and test new innovations in practice. So while cities themselves are often not the ones creating the new innovations, but cities can have a uh, fairly big impact and effect on either helping or hindering the development and introductions of new solutions in practice. And of course, digitalization is quite often involved. A lot of innovations and testbed activities are related to that. It also has a connection to the living lab approaches and uh, involvement and inclusion of citizens. I mean, our data strategy also uh, points out uh, the relevance of using data and digital solutions to better address and incorporate the citizens' needs in developing better services for them. So including the people personally, uh, all the way to taking into account uh, personal data and my data principles, for example. And if I get the next slide, please. The way we're kind of addressing this strategic goal of developing the city as a test bed, we have a website, testbed.helsinki, uh, where you can find more information about the different themes and topics, different fields we have, test bed activities and living lab type activities, uh, including ed tech health, for example. And one of them is smart mobility, which I'm coordinating. And uh, in general, the approach is that we try to help the companies, researchers, other developments in developing the new solutions and creating new business and growth through that. And of course, as a city, we are connected to a lot of the either direct or indirect functions and infrastructure that is more or less relevant for a lot of the different services and solutions. Uh, 
done by the different companies. So we have a some sort of role often, especially when it comes to transportation and mobility. For example, streets are quite relevant often. And of course, at the same time in our development activities, we try to match the new ideas and innovations coming from the different uh, smarter companies uh, together with the city's own needs and interests in order to create the most functional city as we aim to be and therefore uh, putting into practice and hopefully scaling up and integrating what makes sense and getting the better services for the citizens. And next slide, please. So to focus now specifically on the mobility lab activities, uh, we're coordinating our mobility lab activities from the city side, especially from the economic development side. And this is done in collaboration with Forum Virium Helsinki, which is the innovation company owned by the city, who do a lot of the new data and digitalization related uh, development projects where the city is involved. And uh, the connection to the transport uh, planners, for example, traffic managers is done in tight collaboration based on the different cases, but the economic development angle is heavily, uh, heavily uh, coded everywhere in our activities. So it's really the company oriented approach of taking their ideas rather than uh, pushing the needs of the city too clearly. So we're not procuring things to specifically match our needs, but rather seeking out the ideas and finding out what's out there. Uh, next, please. So the objectives really are focused on new innovations, addressing the traffic and mobility challenges. So making transport smoother, safer, and more sustainable by means of especially digital solutions and services, new technologies. Uh, we try to help get better solutions for the users, whether they are the residents or the city or different companies. And of course, the key here is to help businesses create new ideas, grow through references and showing, proving that their solutions work. At the same time as a city, we're trying to learn what helps different types of organizations from startups to bigger companies the best, what we can do. And uh, next, please. Uh, here's a, a general map of the area where we're specifically focused. The district is called Yatkasari, hence the name of the mobility lab. And the broader area around it is uh, a West Harbor area. It includes a very busy passenger port, meaning that the area, which is basically an island, has actual traffic challenges, congestion when a lot of trucks, cars, and passengers are coming through the ports. And uh, it's also growing rapidly. Within the next five to 10 years, the population will be doubled from roughly 10 to 20,000 people. So there are also constructions ongoing, which brings other kinds of challenges, for example, related to safety or emissions from heavy vehicles, things like that. And of course, uh, being very near to the city center, the, the hope is that people wouldn't be driving too much, or at least they wouldn't have a need to own a vehicle themselves, but the different options new solutions in addition to public transportation would be suitable enough. Uh, next, please. So in simple terms, what we try to do is that we help deploy and test new solutions in the real urban environment. Uh, there are different ways by which we help and support the development and these range from helping the right, helping finding the right contacts in the city organization, 
to discuss new ideas, um, piloting interests, or the feasibility of the concepts and potential uh, role what the city might have, uh, basically sparring the different companies with their ideas, finding suitable places, and uh, discussing and acquiring permits for implementations in the streets, uh, finding synergies with other projects and helping figure out how to utilize available uh, data or smart infrastructure and uh, engaging citizens and collaborating in communication, figuring out how to get new RDI projects done, basically. And uh, since the different possibilities of what the different uh, technologies or services companies might come up with range a great deal from land to sea to air, basically covering almost anything. Some are more physical uh, services, uh, some require installments on the streets and some are mobile applications, for example. Uh, they are varying, uh, there are varying degrees of complexity and challenges, which are then tackled case by case. So basically, the more complex the ideas, the more there are ties to the physical environment, such as installing new hardware or having to uh, figure out how traffic should be managed around a pilot, the more difficult it may be to implement things. And uh, when it comes to getting feedback from users and involving them, of course, there are challenges uh, with how uh, mature the different solutions should be and what the direct value for the people are uh, in order to really encourage and motivate them to use them. And uh, basically we're trying to help figure out how to tackle these kind of issues and uh, what kind of solutions are actually feasible to be tested. And uh, while it's often more challenging to get tests done in the real urban environment with its somewhat, uh, in some cases, limiting situations and existing uh, operations. It also provides a lot of value for the different companies. So rather than going into a laboratory environment or somewhere in the middle of the woods to try some transport solutions, uh, the real environment provides a context for really understanding how the things fit in different places what the challenges are, what you need to take into account, and importantly, how the real users perceive and uh, react to the different solutions. And uh, uh, next, please. Yeah, I'll in the end come back to the other ways of helping, helping uh, different companies and different ideas to be implemented. But since the topic here is especially on living labs and user engagement is often very heavily uh, considered a part of that, I'm going to highlight that a little bit more here. So while we're not solely focused on services directed at end users, they're quite often an important part of that. So we do incorporate the users in different ways and in different phases of the development and testing and ideation of new solutions. So we do uh, arrange uh, some surveys and workshops, for example, to understand the needs and challenges that people have, to understand what they really want and what kind of solutions might have more potential of being uh, taken up by the people. And of course, uh, for providing feedback on different concepts that are planned to be implemented. And then perhaps most importantly, as the actual test users of the different kinds of solutions to provide feedback on what really works and uh, what doesn't for the different companies to learn from that. Uh, for this, we use, uh, for instance, a mailing list of the most interested residents in the area who have indicated that they are happy and willing and interested in participating in testing new kind of ideas sort of the front runners of new technology adoption and of then in addition of course the dis 
districts, residents own Facebook groups and uh, media and other communication methods, along with the different uh, workshops and events that are held in the area for the residents. Uh, as I think I mentioned before, uh, there are of course challenges, uh, different considerations for when, to, when and how the users can be engaged. I mean, the different kind of solutions provided to them for testing need to be mature enough. So really early solutions can't really be provided to a, a large audience in some smaller workshops, of course, uh, some concept design, for example, can be done. But when it comes to actually trying to provide a service for people to use for longer periods of time, there needs to be a good enough user interface, for example, and services need to work, there needs to be a direct benefit or value for the users themselves, for them to be motivated enough to test them. Of course, occasionally we have some campaigns where we provide some rewards such as gift cards to local restaurants for people participating in pilots but in the end really engage the users services themselves should be at a suitable level to really get the insights from or the true views of the people and uh the benefits of incorporating and engaging the citizens, of course, is that the feedback often is quite direct and honest, and simply the adoption of the different services shows whether there is any potential to the ideas or if they are not, not good enough yet. And uh, of course, testing in the real environment uh, shows what kind of challenges there are for introducing the solutions all the way from communication to the people and what kind of services you're competing against, what kind of stakeholders need to be involved, how to get things actually done if it requires physical implementations and so on. I'm gonna provide a few case examples with a little bit different angles of uh, the citizen role here. So as the first example, uh, a little over a year ago, one of the uh, one of the pilots we had was done through an agile piloting program, which basically means that occasionally we have open calls for new kind of uh, innovations. In this case, new mobility services directed at tourists, residents, or other travelers, and typically a few solutions are selected that are provided a funding of somewhere around 10 to 20,000 euros to implement a fairly uh, short term pilot in practice. And the challenges for these kind of calls are uh, typically defined together with the city, other relevant stakeholders in the area, and also taking into account the needs and views, voices from the citizens. So one of the pilots uh, was a shared ride service for uh, kids uh, so that after school they would have an organized uh, ride to take them to the football practice instead of the usual way where practice is a little bit later and after school the kids need to either wait uh, or go home and then the individual parents take them to the practice and back. So obviously the old way of doing things means that parents have to waste a lot of time and the kids may have some uh, uh, not so convenient gaps between school and practice so in this case the pilot idea itself came from the residents and the active parents themselves and it was done together with the local football club so involving the users in actually participating here was uh, quite straightforward as the case had a direct link to the kids playing for the club or in the club. And essentially the agile piloting approach here and the encouragement and support through that, uh, in this case, including a bit of funding for doing the pilot led to a solution that uh, 
really addressed and actually came from the residents' own needs. And in the end, it helped save the parents' time and uh, connect those practice schedules a little bit better. And uh, as the sort of mobility lab approach and the city's interest in these kind of new pilots, of course, is creating new lessons learned and sharing the best practices. And here, a uh, guidebook for was developed so that other uh, sports clubs, for example, interested in similar solutions can better figure out what was done and how they might implement it themselves. And next slide, please. So uh, another example here is uh, shared cargo bikes. So uh, cargo bikes are something that uh, residents have uh, clearly shown an interest for when they've been asked through different surveys, for example, on what kind of solutions would be welcome additions and would fit their mobility needs. So while in Helsinki, we already have a very popular and good city bike service, cargo bikes themselves are not really available too much. And to address this need raised by the citizens, and also to help companies trying to develop and introduce these kinds of services to markets. Uh, we've had a few pilots with these kind of services in the past couple of years. So in 2019, one of these uh, pilots was done in the Atkazara district with the aim to provide the residents with an alternative for uh, basically using their own cars so that they could do their grocery shopping, take the groceries uh, easier in the nearby areas, or for example, taking their kids to the kindergarten rather than taking a car. And uh, the service itself in that pilot had some hundreds of users. And the main thing is that it provided the company providing the service, piloting the service with some valuable learnings uh, regarding how the service concept should be done and what would be a reasonable model, how it would work. And uh, this includes, for example, how and where the cargo bike should be left, if there should be dedicated areas or freely wherever in the district. And uh, since the service has received a lot of interest, both in the pilot as well as outside of that, from the users and citizens. And uh, the feedback from the pilot was quite good. Uh, the following year, so in 2020, another pilot, but actually the same company, was done uh, by the Helsinki City Transport. And there, uh, their small pilot call. In this, they had taken into account the lessons learned from the earlier pilots on how to redesign the concept and uh, make it more approachable and better for the people themselves. So this kind of uh, iterative development process and a practical pilots helped take faster steps forward in the service development. And in the end, the following pilots ended up getting very much uh, higher rates of use and perceived as a better user experience. And uh, collaboration with the city organizations has helped the smaller company as a reference to start a dialogue with new parties as well. It's one of the key benefits of the piloting activities in general. And next, please. And uh, here's a little bit more physical a case example. So at the end of 2019, one of the pilots we had in the area was done with an Estonian company, Berkman, whose solution is a smart pedestrian crossing a system which has sensors to detect approaching vehicles and pedestrians and uh, figuring out if there are uh, dangerous conflict situations and then warning or notifying the drivers about it through lights or sounds. And uh, this was the first, first real world implementation the company had for the solution. Uh, through that, they found uh, 
some, they found basically the pilot to be a crucial moment in their uh, company's path towards markets and the development of their solution. So this was a bit more complex system to actually pilot compared to the previous examples, since it required power and permits to actually install the solution in the city streets and ensuring that it's uh, according to according to uh, all kinds of safety related issues and what can be done where finding the right place and so on and uh, yeah so the practical testing really provided uh, lessons about the technology itself as well as the views of the city planners as well as the people uh, living in the area. So for example, how people perceive the different uh, lights and types of warnings. And uh, it led to some insights into what really works and what kind of challenges the concept and the approach taken had, what the needs of the city authorities and the people would be. And uh, in the end, it help the company in redefining or refining their concept and the solution, and developing a new generation of the system, tackling some of the issues found. So it provided, the pilot provided valuable, very direct and critical feedback from both the city planners and the citizens, which was useful for uh, avoiding doing more uh, costly and so I'm taking uh, development activities towards paths that don't really have a future. So the value of the real world testing here was considered quite significant since a lot of the issues that were identified can only be uh, identified when the thing is tested in practice. And also the media atten attention of the real world testing was something that helped the company quite a bit in terms of basically capitalizing from the visibility and context that they received from this. And uh, next slide, please. Here's basically a range of different kind of uh, angles or approaches we have in, in how we try to help the different companies, basically case by case, uh, figuring out what the role of the city is and what we can do, how we can introduce them to the right stakeholders, either in the city organization or other places, understanding the con context in the environment, how to utilize the uh, data and infrastructure that is available, what the city might do in uh, implementing new solutions, how to engage the citizens themselves, uh, what kind of agile piloting calls we have from case uh, from time to time, and other kind of dissemination and visibility supports we may provide when uh, piloting together with different companies. And uh, next, this is kind of the main message we have to the interested companies, researchers, developers. So get in touch with us. We're very happy to talk about your ideas and try to figure out if they address the challenges we're trying to tackle, making transport and mobility smoother, safer, and more sustainable, and figuring out what the role of the city might be and how the city could help advance the development and experimentation of your novel innovations. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Yuho, uh, for your presentation and, and for sharing with, with us your experience on working with Living Labs in Helsinki. I think it's really impressive the ways, uh, the different ways you engage with uh, citizens and also the way uh, you focus on the value that uh, the Living Labs activities uh, bring to the companies that are involved in these in this pilots. Um, well, now we are moving to our third uh, speaker. Um, we are moving to Greece, where uh, Jose Maria Salanova will share with us um, 
their experience in working with Living Labs, uh, specifically in the city of Thessaloniki. Uh, please, uh, Jose Maria, go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jordi, and uh, welcome everyone from my side. Uh, first, a brief introduction about uh, ourselves. I work for uh, CERT, which is the Center for Research and Technology Hellas. And uh, within, within CERT, I work for HIT, the Hellenic Institute of Transport. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, transport uh, institutes in, in Europe. And uh, we are covering, as you can see in our sectors, uh, most of the uh, transport domains uh, from uh, in vehicle, infrastructure, transport economics, uh, everything. Next slide. A few initiatives of our institute uh, that are relevant to this talk today. Uh, we are members of ENOL. This is important because uh, we have been certified by ENOL that we have a living lab. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have been uh, selected to, to lead together with uh, the GRC, uh, the working group uh, on mobility uh, at ENOL, which is an interesting initiative because we're putting together all the mobility living labs and they're a uh, same uh, table to discuss uh, how to proceed in our research. We're also core members of the IT. We are uh, leading uh, the risk hub in Greece, the scientific coordination of it, and we are having a cluster in, in, in Greece. It's important, all these activities, especially the last two, because uh, this is a way to be, con to be connected to the companies, to be connected to the industry, which are the ones that are uh, coming to us and we're innovating together. We're using the, the Living Lab to help them to uh, innovate in their products. So next slide, please. Uh, the benefits. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. It's something that uh, this exercise, I think it should be done by everyone. What are the benefits to, uh, to have a Living Lab? But uh, more important, what are the benefits of the participants of it? As you and as already it has been discussed and presented, the ecosystem is key. Uh, the Living Lab, it's a real world environment to test solutions, but uh, you need uh, the, the, the actors of the mobility. So when you need the public side, administration, usually they are the ones uh, managing uh, infrastructure in the city, traffic lights, uh, you need academia, you need research, uh, you, uh, which are the ones uh, going, putting, uh, going one step ahead in, in the innovation, in the research ideas. You need private companies, which on the one side are giving the technology, on the other side are doing the, the transport uh, itself. They are moving the people at the end of the day. And of course, you need the citizens, because these are the customers of the transport operators. These are uh, the customers, we can say, of the administrations. So they are uh, the end users of, of everything we, we are doing. Uh, for the administration, the priority is to have a good understanding of the needs of the citizens, which uh, it's, 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 it's becoming easier because of all these co-creation uh, approaches, co-creation techniques that allow uh, the users to have a voice uh, from the very beginning when building a new solution. This is very important. So uh, in order to have this good understanding of the needs of the citizens, administrations will participate and participate in the Living Lab and they uh, can benefit from uh, a support from the whole ecosystem with the data, with our knowledge in uh, the decision making. They are doing policy, they are taking decisions, and we can support them uh, and ensure that this process will fulfill the needs of their citizens, um, of all, all the categories of citizens. This is important, uh, inclusiveness. Uh, the research, of course, academia, university, research centers, we, uh, our priority is to do research, to build, uh, test, implement technological solutions. And uh, we are benefiting of the Living Lab because it, it's our playground. We can test uh, mostly uh, any, anything we want in the city. Uh, we can put new devices, we can have some apps uh, to the citizens, collect the data, do, do some an analysis. So far as creating a, a lot of, of uh, content to, to, to do our research. The private sector, of course, they are selling something. It can be a product, it can be a service, and they want uh, to improve the value of the service. They want to add value to these services in order to increase uh, the customers or uh, the satisfaction of these customers. And finally, the citizens uh, are the ones that they have the need to move. They, they, they have the need to satisfy some needs, some, some activities. 
So in order to move within the city, they need to commute to work. They want to go to the gym. They want to go to the supermarket. They need someone to support them in having this mobility. And this is what uh, the ecosystem is doing, is providing transport operators are putting buses on the streets, bicycles, electric scooters. The city authority is having the traffic lights to help them in move with their private cars. So the, the, the ultimate goal is to uh, satisfy the citizens' needs in moving within the city. So in the next slide, we will talk briefly about the Thessaloniki Smart Mobility Living Lab. Uh, we started officially almost 10 years ago, back in 2012. Uh, it's not that we create a living lab, it's that we, uh, we uh, the living lab was the evolution of uh, previous initiatives. We started uh, willing to host a, a portal of data back in 2005. So at that moment, cloud uh, was uh, still not as, as, as known as today. So we started willing to collect data. And after a few years, we uh, were able to uh, say that we are a living lab because putting all different data sources together, we had created the ecosystem. We had created the infrastructure to collect the data, the infrastructure to build services. So then uh, we decided that, okay, we have any more, it's not a portal. So we went out from our facilities, from our servers, to the city. What we have is a living lab. Our motto is that uh, we need to sense the city. And uh, you will see that our living lab uh, started from the data side, from the infrastructure side. And uh, after uh, we achieved the maturity on the data side, then we started working more in co-creation in having the users with us. So our motto is to sense the city. We need to, to understand what's happening in the city. We need data, we need sensors. And uh, when, uh, when I say we, I mean the ecosystem because CERT by itself uh, has very limited resources and capabilities to have data. But uh, we are leading the living lab. So we are receiving data from the whole ecosystem. And this is very important. So when this is to sense the city, once uh, we have this sensing of the city, we need to create knowledge. We need to analyze the data. We need to extract the value from out of this data and uh, visualize it. This, this is important. Uh, if you want to transfer any information from the data, any knowledge, uh, the best way is to visualize it. Then you can help decision making by visualizing the content you extract from the data. So uh, this is uh, our way, uh, the way we work in, in the Thessalonic Smart Mobility Living Lab or small as uh, this is our, our acronym. So we can go to the next slide. So we collect the data, we process the data, we have a lot of models, uh, transport models, data models to extract uh, what I say, the knowledge, to visualize it, and then we can have applications. Applications can be for the public authorities, but applications can also be for the citizens or for the companies. So our, our, end custom, our customers uh, are uh, these three uh, sectors. We are building uh, algorithms. Uh, we are using data analytics uh, to uh, provide and to create this, this value. So we can go to the next slide. So uh, we can say that our infrastructure is composed of two layers. Uh, the first layer is the physical infrastructure. We need, uh, we can call it hardware. We need the sensors in the city. I will show you a few of them in, in the next slides. The second layer is the digital infrastructure. It's some kind of software. So we are collecting the data using our hardware. We are analyzing the data and creating value using our software. And here it's interesting that we are uh, supporting the real world uh, environment with uh, modeling and simulation environments. I th I th we think that this is very important because if you can model you can build scenarios. You can test something that is not happening today. Uh, if you have simulation environments as well, you can test something that is not feasible. And this will be one of the obstacles. Uh, for example, uh, drones. Uh, we have seen different regulations about drones. In Thessaloniki, we cannot fly the drones in the city because we're close to the airport. So uh, this, this means that uh, drones cannot be used in our living lab, but we have the simulation environment supporting this. 
So if you can have this environment, you can test something that maybe is not easy, but at the same time, uh, you can scale up. In, uh, in the our pilots, we are testing with a few users, with a few units, a few traffic lights. So it's not always uh, easy to, to have the whole picture. Then we can go, we used to go to simulation. Okay, now that I, I understood in the real world what happens, I will scale up my solution to the whole city. This, first of all, is something that is not feasible in terms of, of, of budget. You cannot just implement something in the whole city, but it's, it's, it's not easy. All the way around, we can use simulation before the pilot, because uh, if we want to test, for example, speed advice in the city, uh, we can use the simulation to identify the best area in the city to test this solution. So simulation, it can come before some kind of ex-ante analysis to find the best area and the best configuration to test something in the city. You can go to the, to the real world. And then after the real world testing, you can again use simulation to scale up, to change some parameters. So it creates much more rich results for the company and for, for ourselves. So uh, putting together these, these two levels of infrastructure, we can create test beds. Uh, the concept of living lab before being a living lab, uh, it was called a test bed. It was much more technological, less co-creation and citizens engagement, but still uh, we had test beds before uh, we had living labs. And wh wh what we call a test bed is a specific application of these two pillars. It can be something for cooperative, autonomous driving, something for data analytics, traffic management, it's uh, a, a living, our living lab is composed of various test beds. So we can go to the next slide. D data sources, just a few pictures uh, to show you our data sources. We have Bluetooth detectors, 43 uh, locations in the city from where, which we collect uh, uh, anonymized MAC, MAC IDs. So we can track uh, devices within the city. Uh, conventional sensors, loops and cameras uh, from the public authorities. We can collect speed, uh, volume and occupancy. Uh, the Bluetooth detectors is our own infrastructure. We own, it's the, the only one that we own at CERF. Floating car data, this is a very good data set we have. Uh, it is the collaboration with the Taxi Association. We have 1,000 taxis on the streets. Uh, on average, 400 of them are moving and creating uh, data for us. This data is speed, of course, but it's also uh, if there's a customer or not. So we are following people moving in the city from the Bluetooth, from floating car data when, you, when using a taxi. Of course, uh, everything is GDPR compliant, so we are having anonymized data and we cannot track back track anyone, but still we need this data to understand the mobility patterns. We, go, we can go to the next slide. And this is very important. Mobility patterns is uh, one of the most important knowledge that every city should have, because these are the needs of my citizens. How are they moving, uh, spatially and temporally, so I can give to them uh, the best mobility solution for it. We have also smart traffic lights. Uh, we have a connection with the uh, bike sharing company. Uh, we have a connection with the national train operator. And we have also some data from social media. So next slide, uh, we will have two more data sources. We are uh, having now uh, uh, an agreement with the parking operator. So we also can have data about the parking status in the city and with the e-scooter operator in, in the city. So uh, we can go to the next slide. As uh, you can see that we have a lot of data sources and this was our, our initial focus. And, uh, it's what is giving us the, the possibility on the one side to create a service because we can activate the connection with any of our members of the ecosystem. But on the other side, we can monitor, we can track how the implementation of the service is going uh, using all these data sources. And then uh, we have built different uh, portals, different services that are meant to the citizens. You can see, uh, for example, the traffic speeds, traffic status in the city being created from the floating car, floating car data. We are giving open data. This is important for us. Uh, most of the data sets, we are uh, giving them as open data, both historical data, but real time data. So we want to foster uh, the local uh, community, the local companies, or even the university students, teachers, 
to use professors to use this data. So they can recreate our services, they can do their research and their analysis. And we're also collaborating with the local police, for example. They saw the potential in this data and we're helping them to manage the, their assets based on the traffic status. So we can go to the next slide. This is the ecosystem. Uh, we're having uh, here four pillars. Two of them are, are uh, related to the private sector, but still research and academia, private administ public administration, industry and technology. These are the small or larger companies giving all the technology that we need to sense the city. And of course, uh, the transport, uh, transport operators. We are tracking all these vehicles, so uh, this is very important for our services. Uh, and of course, we have the citizens that are the participants of, of the projects. So the next slide. Here we have an example. Uh, we uh, used to build uh, dashboards about the execution of the projects, about the indicators of the pilot implementations. Here you can see, for example, the dashboard of the project that I will show you at the end of my presentation. Uh, it's showing the origins and destinations of people using a ride sharing service. In the next slide, we have more examples. Uh, here you can see the dashboard we built for the bike sharing company. Uh, it's important uh, because we talk about ecosystem. It's yes, we need the ecosystem, but we need them to be on board. We need them to be at least passive members of, 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 the, of the living lab. And the way we do this is uh, we engage them uh, by project. So we are having projects, we are building new services. We use the projects to engage new actors in Thessaloniki. And once uh, we have the project, we build something that they, they understand the value. They understand that it's something that they want to have. So uh, they see this some kind of value uh, return on their contribution to the living lab. Even if the contribution is only data, so we can say that it's passive contribution. I am giving my data on, in, on an automatic way, so I don't need to, to, get to, to, to put effort, but still we need this, this passive uh, participation. And to do this, we need to convince them. So we, need, we want uh, and we are doing, we are giving uh, value back. When we receive the data from any of the participants of the ecosystem, we are building services inside projects or in outside of the projects, services that they want to have. So they, we are keeping their interest in, in the living lab. And this is key. This is key because it's not only to grow, to grow but to keep uh, the, the members you have today. So here you can see one of the projects. It was a project that engaged the bike sharing operator. We uh, had a proposal to build a new app and a new dashboard for them to better manage the bike sharing system in the city and to have a better uh, app for the citizens with some gamification to uh, improve or to increase the number of users. So we built uh, an appealing dashboard and today is being used by the, the, authority, the authority, the company managing the bike sharing system. So they are on board, they are giving us the data and uh, in, if in the future we want to have a project with them, it's very easy because we know them, they are part of the ecosystem, and we have the, the connection to them. We have all the interfaces. So in this way, we can build quite easily any pilot in, in Thessaloniki. So in the next slide, you will have more uh, examples of uh, the dashboards. Here we can see some uh, maps, density maps, heat maps of social activity in Thessaloniki from social media. Uh, you can see the locations of the e-scooters, the trips of the e-scooters. Uh, and here uh, I, I want to highlight that uh, having different data sources allow us to do uh, some combined analysis because these data sources are not independent. I can, ha I can see uh, someone in the city using an electric scooter and then uh, having uh, activity on the social media. So, these two different data sources, they belong to the same person, data, data records. So it's important, again, not having pri private data, personal data, but, but an, in an aggregated way to link these two data sources, because when we are giving back value to someone giving us data, uh, if we use only the, the data, it's something that they can do, because they have the data. 
But if we combine their data with other data sets that they do not have, is when we are creating the real value. So in the next slide, you will see uh, more, uh, more figures about it. Uh, how we create this value? We are applying uh, data analytics, AI, to, for example, to predict. For the bike sharing company, we are predicting the demand in the next three hours, so we can help them in rebalancing the stations, the bicycles at the stations, and ensure that all the customers will find the bicycle when they will look for it. This is important. So this is the knowledge we are creating, and we are giving it back to the, to the participant of the Living Lab. In the next slide, you can see an example of what, what I, I was saying before. In this map, you can see in blue, taxis uh, taking a customer. No, sorry, no, not taking a customer, uh, a customer going down from a taxi. In red, you can see uh, checking events from Facebook. So it's clear that at some moments of the week, at some days of the week, Saturday night, Friday night, these two data sets are quite related. People is taking a taxi to go to a bar and some of them are checking in in the bar. So this was the added value. We can predict a potential customer in an area of the city by using the social media activity. And we can tell this to the taxi drivers. So this is the value that they cannot have from their, the, only their, their data sources. So we can go to the next slide. This is a, a recent example. Uh, we were working on it uh, in September 2020. Uh, we saw that having all these data sets, we can somehow build a density map of the citizens in Thessaloniki. And we used to build a pedestrian routing to uh, avoid crowded streets. This was really relevant for COVID, not only for pedestrians, for uh, bicycle uh, users, for e-scooter users, the ones that are exposed to, to, to the other people. If they can have the less crowded route, they may feel safer or uh, that it will, it will be less easy to, uh, to, to, to have uh, COVID because they are uh, finding people in, on their street. So next, next slide. And uh, of course, uh, once uh, we end up our first lockdown in March, uh, we built a dashboard. Uh, we took all the, our data sets, we plot this uh, time series from uh, early 2020, and we uh, build, we plot these four uh, orange lines. These four lines uh, in orange, vertical, are the measures that the state took during the first lockdown. And uh, using the data, we can see the reaction of people. We can see in the first one, social media activity was uh, related to checking events was reduced quite significantly. Taxis on the streets and people taking a taxi was reduced uh, by 10 dramatically. Uh, number of bicycles, you can see that between the first and the second vertical line, there is an increase because the first measure it was to close schools. So people decided, okay, we will go out because we don't have to go to school, we don't have to go to work. But after the second measure, you will see that uh, uh, an almost reduction to zero of the, of the use of bicycles. So this is very interesting to understand the reaction or even uh, if the people were following or not the, these measures taken uh, by the state. So next slide. Now, about uh, obstacles and barriers uh, we have seen, uh, we have uh, uh, overcome from our experience. First of all, is the lack of funding. Uh, this is important. Uh, we can have living labs that may can have an state funding, can be one million per year. This is great because they have this money, they know that they have it, and they can do the research uh, without caring of, of uh, having new funding. In our case, uh, we are a project oriented, means that the whole living lab was created, is maintained on projects. So we need constantly to be participating to proposals and to be awarded by projects that will uh, create the new step, the new data set, the new service in, in the living lab. 
Of course, uh, this is uh, something at, at the short, medium uh, term. At the long term, we want the Living Lab to be self-sustainable. If we are creating value, if we can sell this value, if we can have income from this value, is it's a way that we can become, if not 100%, maybe 50% self-sustainable. So we have less pressure on having projects. Second, citizens' engagement. Of course, this is key. And uh, it's not always easy uh, because uh, when you go out and talk to people, sometimes it's not that they are you are at zero, you, you are at minus 10 because they had bad experience with other projects that end in nothing. Uh, they have the feeling that all this money in research and it's just going uh, nowhere. So sometimes uh, it's very hard to convince them. But we are happy that uh, we are convincing them because in our projects, we are giving real services to them. So they are feeling the services and they are, they are happy. You can see on the right this uh, image with the different layers of a living lab. Of course, uh, financing and uh, the user's engagement are one of the uh, two of the most important. The next slide. We need to create value. We, do, we need to uh, create capacity between uh, the participants of the Living Lab. This is important because it's the way we will keep them engaged. This is what we are doing. We are having projects. In the projects, we are building services, and they are keeping the services. We are maintaining the services. This is also key. Many projects, after the project end, the service is not maintained. The, the service just, just uh, stops working because there is no maintenance from anyone. We are keeping alive all the services that we are building. And this, this is important because we have the trust of the partners that it will not be a six month pilot. It will be a six month pilot. And then after the pilot, it will continue if they want to use it. If, if, if they are not happy, we can just stop. So it's, it's important to understand uh, the framework of, of the whole living lab, how it works and to uh, create this trust from the partners. So in the next slide. The last one about obstacles, uh, as I said, regulations. In, in our, we had a pilot in sharing a taxi, which is forbidden in Greece by law. So we needed to do uh, uh, some contracts. So it, 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 we finally were able to have the pilot legally, but uh, we needed to put a lot of effort on finding a solution to this legal barrier. So this can be also uh, an obstacle to, to the living labs. And of course, what the living labs are doing are trying to bridge the gap between theory and, um, theory and practice, taking the results from research, putting them in, in the cities. So is this, this loop about exploring, what do you need, creating a solution for it, implementing it, and then assessing. And this, this assessment is very important to understand, okay, what I did, it works, the technology can work, yes, it can do what it was uh, uh, meant to do, but maybe it's not uh, fulfilling the need that I, 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 I had at the beginning. So it's important to have this assessment and then go back again. If you can assess, you can understand what it works and what it does not work. You can uh, iterate and together with the citizens, co-create and have a solution that is working, really working. Next slide, and I am going to the last part of the presentation about the different examples we had in Thessaloniki. Here we had different projects about cooperative services, Compass 4D, Cogistics, FLC, and C-Mobile. All these projects, uh, three of them have end, C-Mobile is ending, but uh, they, are uh, they are keeping, uh, we are keeping them alive. We are keeping the roadside units, we are keeping the services, we are keeping the connections to the traffic lights, we are keeping everything. So this is, this is key. On the next slide, you will have much uh, more projects uh, dealing with uh, data analytics, uh, on-demand sharing transport, autonomous driving. Again, all these projects, uh, we are trying to keep them alive. Uh, it's not all, always easy. For example, with COVID, we should, we should stop one of our most successful, successful pilots. That is what I will present in the next slide. So uh, I, saw, I want to have just a two, two, two slides about uh, this project, Galileo for Mobility. Uh, we are happy about it because uh, the users were uh, really happy about it. They were using it for 11 months. We had thousands of trips and uh, we see this as a success. 
but uh, you will see in the next slide a few uh, facts about the success, this success. What we were doing here is uh, we're putting people living close to each other and working close to each other or on the same uh, trajectory uh, to, to share a taxi. So we were uh, taking two, three, four people that they were using mostly their car and we we're putting them in a taxi. So we were reducing the number of cars in the city center. This was the aim of the project. And we were uh, connecting two zones of the city with the city center. So in the next slide, we will see some facts and figures about this pilot. Uh, we had a pilot of 11 months. The duration of the pilot in most projects are close to one year. And uh, we are quite happy with that we were able to keep it for 11 months. Indeed, we stopped in March 2020 because of COVID. In COVID, we had two problems, teleworking, so no need to travel. And uh, it was forbidden to have more than two people on the taxi. So we were forced to stop the service. So if not, we, we would have kept it for 12 months and then it would have been continued as a, as a commercial service, which this was very important for us. We started with 10 users and at the end we had 55. This was important because uh, these, 50, these 45 additional users, they, they came uh, together with the initial ones. I mean that the initial ones, they were happy with the service and they became ambassadors of, of, of the service. So they were telling us, I have a coworker, I have a, a family member, I have a neighbor, I have a friend that would like to use the service. So uh, we were very happy about it because when people is proposing to the others to use a service that they like it, you can see the high rate of the users in all the strips, 4.8 out of 5. Uh, savings, we are talking about uh, between 30 and 45 minutes trip, and they were saving 10 to 15. So it's a savings of uh, one third, one fourth of the travel time. This is important. And they, they were acknowledging this because uh, they were willing to uh, pay for the service. Uh, in, in the pilot, we were shifting to a commercial service. So we were charging them a bit to, towards the end of the pilot. And uh, in April, we, we would start with a commercial service totally funded by the users themselves. And it's important that they were willing to pay two to 3.5 euros per trip. Uh, it means that they understand the importance of the service, the usefulness of the services, and they are engaged. So uh, we are waiting the, for this pandemic to, to fin, to, to finalize. So maybe we can uh, catch up again with, with the service. We uh, scheduled more than 10,000 trips and we executed satisfactorily uh, more than 7,500. So for us, this is a, a great success because we're talking about 705,000 more than, than this number trips of people trusting us to go from home to the working place. The occupancy is it was two. Of course, we wanted to have a higher occupancy, but uh, to do this, you need a critical mass and 55 uh, persons are not a critical mass for this kind of services. But uh, as, a, as a proof of concept, uh, the service was successful. You can see that some data about, about the, the kind of trip we were, we were uh, gi uh, giving to them. So we can go to the last slide. Here you have different links. Uh, I will be happy to, uh, to see you visiting our links, our uh, center, the Smart Mobility Living Lab. We have a dashboard in which we can see some of the data sets, open data. Feel free to use any of the data we have there to, for your research. And you can also see this uh, COVID-19 mobility report to see what happened in Thessaloniki during uh, the first lockdown. And you will have data also about the second lockdown. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jose Maria, for your presentation and for sharing with us so many examples of the Living Labs projects uh, that uh, you are living in Thessaloniki. It, it is quite interesting the way you are engaging and coordinating the key lo local stakeholders in your local ecosystem and, and also the use of the modeling as part of the, the innovation process. Well, now, um, we are, we are uh, getting to the last part of the webinar um, that is focused on uh, providing some tips and advice on how to address uh, this uh, Living Lab 
uh, topic on uh, your project proposals. Next slide, please. Well, if, uh, if you had the chance to take a look to the um, call for, for proposals for innovation 2022-2024, um, you uh, might already seen that uh, there is a KPI um, that deals uh, precisely on living labs. It is highlighted in blue uh, in, in this slide, demonstrations, pilots or living labs within a proposal that actively involve citizens and or local associations. Next, please. So yeah, um, living labs are uh, a key element of um, this call for proposals. Proposals should demonstrate that the solutions within the proposal life cycle uh, in a minimum of three cities of uh, two member states or associate uh, states. Um, the way to demonstrate impact is to evidence the city's engagement, um, to show the availability of resources such as uh, living labs or uh, the availability of uh, any other additional funding. The way to um, uh, evidence uh, this uh, living lab's uh, involvement in your proposals is in, a, is in the submission system uh, on, on, in our online platform in Plaza, where there are three specific sections, one per each uh, city demonstrator, uh, where you should provide uh, the the specific information on the activities that you plan to carry on in uh, these city demonstrators. Next slide, please. So uh, please let me go through uh, a little bit more in detail in this city demonstrator tab on Plaza, uh, providing some, some tips on, on how to uh, properly um, describe uh, the, the city demonstrators. Well, first of all, it is uh, quite important to identify the area covered in this city demonstrator. It can be a street, a neighborhood, a city, or um, any other um, urban area. Also to explain why did you uh, select this testing area, uh, the location, the scale and relation with the whole city or, uh, or region, and also to, uh, to describe this testing area uh, in terms of uh, urban mobility, traffic flows, um, pub public transport and other uh, micro mobility services available, socioeconomic profile, and also, and that's quite important, to link this um, testing area with the challenge area that uh, you are, or the city, uh, the city challenge that you are trying to address in your proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, then it is also important to identify the resources that cities are committing to this project. Uh, it could be, for instance, uh, demonstrating uh, that you will have access to the demonstration site, who will be the main contact person within the uh, public administration um, in, in the city, uh, and, and any other uh, kind of uh, resources. It could be uh, access to data, access to data collection devices, uh, access to infrastructure, um, access to target groups, dissemination activities, and so others. And also, um, it is important to um, describe if uh, there are other financial resources available, structural funds, social funds, um, and any other kind of local, regional, or national funds available. Next slide, please. So um, it is important to, uh, to explain the selection of the city liaison partner. Um, for instance, uh, you can uh, say that in, in a specific city, the university will be 
dealing with the municipality because they previously work on uh, similar projects and um, they already uh, collaborated closely in the past um, to identify which stakeholders from the local ecosystem will take part in the, in the demonstration, uh, representatives from academia, from uh, the, the local industry, from the, pu the public sector, and also from the civil society. Um, also to provide a, a detailed description of the specific activities um, that will have an, an active involvement of these local stakeholders. If you plan to organize uh, meetings with them, workshops, service, or any kind of activities. And last but not least, also to, to highlight um, how you plan to uh, engage with end users. Um, it is important to clearly identify which target groups will be engaged in your demonstrations. Uh, it could be youngsters, elderly, women, students, commuters, or any other uh, kind of uh, end users. Uh, so that, that was um, my final recap on, on tips and advice uh, on how to address uh, the Living Labs topic in your project proposals. Uh, before uh, moving to the Q and the, the last part to the Q&A, Q uh, I would like to thank the three speakers that, uh, that are with us today uh, for providing and sharing with us uh, their knowledge on uh, working with Living Labs. Uh, I think that the three presentations were uh, quite, quite uh, interesting and provided very, uh, very useful insights uh, to, to, to the attendees. So now um, let's move to the Q&A. Uh, I, I would ask the speakers to turn on their cameras. Okay. Yuho, please, if you can turn on your camera. Okay, great. Um, well, just a practical uh, because it was in the in the chat. Uh, just one practical issue: the recording of this session and uh, and the slides will be uh, available in our uh, website, uh, so you can. You will, you will be able to check um, the presentations after the, after the webinar. And uh, moving to specific uh, questions to, uh, to our speakers, um, I, I would like to, to start with Maria. Um, in, in your presentation, you, you mentioned that in your living lab in ISPRA, the Italian law uh, is applied under your responsibility. Uh, what does uh, exactly mean? Okay, yeah, th that's a good question. Actually, a very special feature, I think, of our reality of our, of our living lab. So uh, the origins of our site are nuclear related. So uh, with, with the site was born um, a few decades ago, it was in the context of nuclear research activities. So the site is fully fenced, has some security considerations and um, and it was in that case decided that the territory would would not belong to to Italy as such but would be uh, managed by the commission and in this case the joint research center is is the one actually applying the Italian law which in any case is the one that is applicable on site but um, it is the one who is in charge of implementing this law on site, so the functioning of, of the site, as if it was, um, as mentioned, like kind of local authority. Um, so it just means this, and to a certain extent, it can provide some flexibility uh, in the sense that we can, let's say, maybe more easily cut uh, a piece of road in order to do some testing. It, ca it can be done in a more agile manner. Uh, but of course, it, the law needs to be applied. This is uh, certainly true. And uh, yeah, this is basically. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, now uh, I see that. Um, well, th th there is there is a question for you, Ho. Um, how, how do you use social media to engage with with uh, citizens and 
other kind of target groups? Uh, do you have any in-house specialist on that, or how do you how do you do that? Well, I would say the main social media way for connecting to the actual residents and citizens it would probably be the Facebook group that the residents in the specific district have, and it's a fairly good good channel since it's a it's an area that is growing rapidly it's being developed which means that the people are quite interested in what is happening in general in the area and the share of people actually in the group is very high for the people living there so it kind of works quite well and as i think i mentioned that we also have a mailing list for the people that are the most interested in this kind of uh, testing Development. Okay, thank you. Well, you, you also mentioned in uh, your presentation that um, in Helsinki, uh, you do have uh, an innovation company, Forum Bidium. Um, how, do you how do you work with them? How do you collaborate? Uh, do you have an, any predefined distribution of uh, roles or uh, it, is, uh, it is decided on a project uh, basis? Uh, well, we worked work very closely together. I mean, from the city side, we're coordinating this, these mobility lab activities, but they are the co-coordinators. We have somewhat different roles. For example, the more direct citizen engagement is primarily on Forum Birium side, as are the open calls we have in the mobility lab project. But when it comes to the different uh, different uh, new initiatives we have uh, let's say the more day-to-day -day collaboration with the different companies and uh, support from the city side perhaps falls more on our side but when it's a new bigger project uh, forum virum is more a project-based organization so when we need new hands to take on new projects they are typically the ones to take that role so we figure things out together. And when they are done as pilot projects, for example, EU projects, it's typically Forum Virium on behalf of the city participating. And then we, from the city side, uh, connect the right experts and right departments from the city to take things into the day-to-day -day operations and figure out how it might fit into the city organization. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, uh, explaining that because I think it's it's a very good example on how cities can um, organize uh, themselves uh, when dealing with uh, innovation in, in urban mobility. Um, there is a, another uh, question. Um, this time is for Josep Maria. Um, uh, yeah, it's about the, the governance of the Living Lab in Thessaloniki. Um, because it seems that uh, you are not the owners of the infrastructure. Uh, you are just managing the, the infrastructure. So how do you organize uh, the Living Lab? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a good point and quite relevant to us. Uh, until uh, now, we are having a bilateral uh, MOUs with all the participants. Uh, but as we, uh, as we know, uh, the, the number of participants is quite high. Uh, we are building an MOU uh, for everyone. So we are uh, building an MOU that everyone will, will sign, which is putting uh, the rules, uh, the data is provided, how the, the data is used, and we are uh, defining the governance in, into this MOU. Uh, as we see, uh, we are hosting and leading the, the Living Lab. We are the front runners in the projects, uh, and then uh, we, we want to keep this role. So, at the same time, uh, it, we are uh, analyzing the possibility of giving the living lab uh, a, a, a legal form because now the, the living lab is, is nothing, it's, it's an agreement between us. But if, uh, if we decide to go for a living lab having a legal form, then it would be easier because the, the living lab it will be an entity. Now the living lab is, is, is ourselves representing the living lab. So we are, uh, we are checking if we will go for a legal form and then the governance will be part of the module. Thank you, Jose Maria. Um, I think it's it's quite relevant because probably 
many cities are also facing the, the, the same problems and the same obstacles. Um, that there is also one um, question on the chat that maybe I can answer is related to the involvement of cities from City Club in consortia. Um, well, uh, I would recommend to check uh, the admissibility and eligibility uh, requirements of the call um, because um, the kind of partners that, get, that should be involved in these um, project proposals are clearly described there. As um, I don't see any further questions. Well, I, I see a comment related to um, to uh, yeah, how Living Labs could uh, provide uh, the right end user profiles. Um, I think that maybe uh, Jose Maria could uh, answer that. Um, Graham Hansen uh, is uh, developing a sustainable taxi uh, and um, he, he would like to know if uh, a living lab could bring uh, the right end user profile um, to, to developing the right solution. Yeah, uh, this uh, I, I understand is related to the mobility pattern uh, that I mentioned. And it's something that uh, I think every city should have some kind of profile of, of the people. So uh, if if we know socioeconomic data about the people, if we know their habits in, in traveling, then it's the way that you can uh, build a, a tailored mobility service for them. It can be this, this taxi service. So uh, for this, you need data. Uh, the tricky part is GDPR, that before GDPR, we were having Mac ID data uh, from day to day. So we were having day-to-day -day patterns. With GDPR, you cannot go uh, longer than one day of data of un unanonymized, and it's very tricky to, to link socioeconomic data. So you need then to go for a more questionnaire uh, methodology in which you have the consent of the people to give their socioeconomic data. But still, uh, some AI techniques can, can build this, these profiles uh, from anonymized data uh, trying to understand if they are taxi users, they are uh, pedestrians, they are uh, bicycle users. And indeed, if, if you can have this value, this knowledge, you can build a service that they, they will buy it. So this is, is important, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so just uh, for closing the, the webinar, um, I would like to uh, organize a, a short uh, round table. Um, if uh, the speakers uh, want to close um, by providing any further recommendation or uh, advice to the to the attendees. Maria, we can start uh, with you. Any final comment? Okay, maybe I can just reiterate uh, how relevant we think it is to to collaborate in, in, in achieving in this case a better urban mobility, a more sustainable one. Um, by establishing a kind of network mobility living lab. So relying on the synergies and, uh, and lessons learned from each other, sharing data, sharing uh, results. So I think the examples also provided by, by my colleagues here today in the panel, I think are very good ones. And uh, to a certain extent, we are already exchanging, we're already doing so in different contexts. So yeah, for us, the, the relevance of continuing doing so um, in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juho, any final comment from your side? Yeah, I suppose just on a general level that we are very happy to discuss any kind of new ideas, new kind of innovations that could be tested in Helsinki. We're doing things on a fairly broad scale, you could say, but in general, if your solutions you know, find better ways to utilize data, digital solutions, artificial intelligence, or provide new kind of mobility services that can move people into smarter modes or different ways of uh, uh, basically nudging people 
or behavioral changes, those kind of things would be very interesting for us. Okay, great. And Jose Maria? Yes, from my side, of course, we will be also happy to host uh, any company, any service in, in the city. And uh, for the participants interested on the Living Lab itself, uh, I, I would suggest that it's important uh, because a Living Lab, it will not come by itself. Uh, it's important to have a, a vision, to have a goal, uh, to have a roadmap to it, and then to find the opportunities to, to complete this roadmap towards the, the Living Lab vision. So it's, it, this, this is important. It's uh, having two, three projects, it, it, it will not create a living lab. Uh, you need something uh, on the background and you need someone to be the front runner. It, that to take, should take the cost of, 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 being, of being this front runner, putting uh, effort in having proposals, and of course, uh, having the, the longer view. Uh, every project should have a follow-up, every project should give something to the living lab. So you are building from very small pieces the, the whole picture. And I think this is important if you want to have your living lab to, to have this in mind. Well, thank you to the three of you uh, for these final comments. Um, I think we are coming to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much to all attendees and uh, looking forward to uh, any upcoming activities related to to living labs. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.